like to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Berger.
we are not thinking about this overall political experiment and economic experiment of European integration. We are thinking about how our societies are becoming more diverse. For instance, how migrants we have outside the European Union coming to the European Union. The issue of the refugees that is so much today in the top of the agenda. And how can our societies lead with increased diversity? And that is very challenging. Why? Because I'm, I'm here in the university context. I'm not speaking as a political leader. I myself am also a professor at the university. And so I have to be completely objective. The reality is that some of our societies in Europe were not ready to accept a level of increased diversity. And there are issues, ethnic issues, religious issues, and sometimes also there is a dimension that is very important. It is a social dimension. Because if the migration comes between people that are more or less rich or wealthy, the problem is not so important. But when there is a disparity of the revenue, and what we have is that now we have countries that are, in economic terms, much below the average, of course it becomes more difficult because there is a temptation, and it is manipulated for political purposes, to say, these people are taking our jobs. That was a major theme in the referendum in Britain, so-called Brexit. According to the service of public opinion, the biggest reason for those voting to leave the European Union, the biggest reason the first, was migration. It was not about the European Commission or about the European Parliament or about this regulation. It was, let's take back control of migration. That was the And we are seeing in Europe some movements, namely from the far right, that are becoming increasingly xenophobic with a very critical attitude to foreigners. At the same time, our societies are receiving more and more foreigners. People with different religions as well. And there are some tensions. Now, I believe we are going to deal with this. I believe Europe has resilience, sufficient resilience, to deal with this. That there are the means, intellectual means, human resources, also financial resources to be able to integrate um, more diverse communities. But it is challenging, and I have to be very honest with you. And one thing that uh, we are watching is say yes to the refugees. Many refugees are, are coming to Europe because their countries of origin are being destroyed. It's the case of Syria. I, I met many of those refugees. I was in South Africa camping program. I spoke with them. Middle class people. Their cities were completely destroyed, bombed. Of course, they do what I would do if I was in their position. If my house is destroyed and I have three kids and I have, they have three sons and two, two grandsons, I would try to escape and go to anywhere in the world where I could live in peace. And Europe is in peace. And Europe is, from that point of view, a great when people tell me the European refugee crisis, I say, I'm sorry, the real crisis is not in Europe, the real crisis is in Syria, or in Iraq, or in Afghanistan, or in Somalia, or in Eritrea. This is where the crisis is. But of course, they come to Europe because they don't want to be in their countries because they cannot live there. I was also in Lampedusa. It's a small island in the south of Italy where those boats come. With millions of people, very poor people from Eritrea, from Libya, from Somalia, and some traffickers, they are exploiting this. These people put all the money they have for them to have, to have a boat, a boat without safety conditions, to reach the south of Italy because they want to be in Europe. And so I think we have a moral obligation a humanitarian duty to receive people that are persecuted and whose life is in danger in those countries. I think we should be. That's why 
I was so proud when Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, said, refugees welcome. She was criticized by many people in Germany. Because say, you cannot do it. But the basic plan is correct. Of course, afterwards, we have to see how to do it. We have to share that obligation among the European countries. But politics, my friends, is about alternatives. No alternative is perfect. So to those who criticize Merkel because she said, refugees welcome, I ask, what would be the solution? Would you like to see Germany say, refugees, no way, close, our doors are closed? What would be the image of Germany and of Europe if she had done that? So this is the issue. I think we can deal with it. I think we can deal with it. We have resources. The European Union today is more than 500 million people. It's one of the richest regions in the world. Of course, we have big problems. We have unemployment very high in some of our countries. But I think that if we share that responsibility, it is perfectly possible to receive and integrate those communities. Not everyone, of course, not everyone. But the refugees, I think we have a debt. And I think that now there is a debate going on in Europe. Uh, we will come to a moderate decision. But as you rightly said, it's not only Europe. This issue of the attitude towards foreigners is probably one of the oldest issues in the history of mankind is what I call the conflict between hospitality and hostility. Do you see a foreigner as a friend, a guest, or as an enemy? At the end, it is a philosophical question. It is a question of principles. Do we consider a foreigner as a potential enemy, or do we consider it as a member of the same mankind we believe? I am on that direction. I'm one of those that think that we can be proud of our country, love our country, be proud of our identity, but at the same time, be open to others. I think that we should be patriots, but not nationalists. There is a difference between patriotism and nationalism. That we should, of course, defend our identity, but be open to other identities. And I think that's the way forward. Because globalization is going to continue, whether some leaders want it or not. Because we may have our identity based on our culture, in our language, sometimes also in our religion, but at the same time, there is one thing that is clear we all belong to the same mankind. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sonsi. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will come to a discussion session. Uh, we will have about half an hour, right? Half an hour for discussions. Uh, whoever that uh, have questions or wants to have some more discussion, we have two mics, actually in the uh, in the uh, early here. So please uh, queue up, and we will take a uh, first session of three. Uh, questions. So please queue up in the um, in the mic. Uh, just uh, walk down to the mic. So while we are waiting, so uh, I would like to uh, just highlight several uh, items or several uh, key notes that uh, I took from uh, from our uh, discussion. Please do not hesitate to come to the mic and uh, and ask questions. I will give uh, three opportunities for the first three uh, participants who would like to ask questions. So, uh, diversity, pluralism, multiculturalism have been a constant challenges. However, it is also opportunity. So, it is not supposed to be our weakness, but I think it is supposed to be our strength. Multiculturalism is not weakness, but it's supposed to be strength. His Excellency Barroso also showed how issues of disparity is triggering uh, current issues in the, um, in the Europe, uh, European Union, by the way. And uh, both our uh, three uh, lead discussions also talk about assimilation efforts and the approach of global solidarity and global responsibility, responsibility that we have to share together. So, um, questions? Everybody? Anyone? I think 
there are plenty to absorb and still think about it. Um, yes, by this time. Asia gave great contributions to civilization. 
In fact, ours, what we define as civilization, it was not really born in Europe, it was born somewhere between Europe and, and Asia. And there are cycles in the history of mankind. So, it's true that after the, what we call the Renaissance, uh, Europe was able to live globally because of many different developments, including science and technology, in terms of navigation, in terms of scientific discoveries, in terms of the industrial revolution afterwards that we have mentioned. But I don't think this is necessarily an attribute to, of Europe on a permanent basis. I think that could have happened, and some other kinds of uh, revolutions, if you want to say, will happen also in other parts of the world. Having said that, the precise question that you have asked me, if Europe is still with those qualities or not, I want to be objective. And I was following it very closely when I was leading the European Commission. If you look at the publication of scientific papers in the most prestigious journals in the world, still Europe that leads, more than the United States. Uh, we don't have that idea because the United States, of course, is one great country. I, and the country that I respect, I was, as you said, just now visiting professor at Princeton before I was at Georgetown University. So they have great, great universities. But in fact, if you look at all European countries, it's Europe number one in terms of contribution to scientific education. As far as we can tell, we know that there are some standard statistics about publication in the most prestigious scientific journals. So Europe remains a powerhouse of science. Americans until now have been more effective than Europeans in terms of translating those scientific discoveries to the market. For instance, everything that has to do with the ICT, with the, they, were, they were able to do it much better, probably because they have, a, I think, a stronger entrepreneurial culture than Europeans in general. But in science, in fundamental science, Europe still leads. Uh, in terms of the tolerance in the point, I think Europe is by definition a laboratory of tolerance because we work together with the uh, gatherers with very different languages. So, um, I be, I'm one of those who believes in cross-fertilization. I think that if you are too homogeneous, if you are close to only one culture, one language, uh, one system, we do not make progress. Progress comes precisely because of cross-fertilization. And when there is so many changes as we have today in the world, the world is changing so fast. Of course, an increased level of diversity is good to cope with an increased level of change and unpredictability. There are people who think opposite, also in Europe. There are people that, and that's the danger of xenophobes and far right, that say, no, we want our country as, uh, let's say, I will not use the word pure, because it was a very dangerous word in the experience of Nazi Germany, but they want as much as homogeneous. It's a mistake, because in fact, progress comes, as I'm here speaking in the university, so I'm sure that many of you know that better than me, when we are able to cross borders, cross not only the physical borders, but intellectual borders, when we can bring some input from the field of economy or mathematics to humanities and the opposite as well, when we are able to see the same phenomenon from different angles. So diversity is good. Not bad, from a scientific point of view. I believe those two characteristics remain in the European spirit. Now, what is wrong in the European? What I'm very more pessimistic about Europe. What I'm more pessimistic is about the what I call sometimes the intellectual labor of pessimism. People in Europe today, and this is not Europe, the United States as well, in the West, they very often want to show they are more intelligent, saying that they are more pessimistic. 
They won't be impressed. That has also to do problem with the demographic thing. The demographics of Europe are not very dynamic. While in Asia they are probably the dynamic, Africa very dynamic the demographics. Europe is going getting older. And so there is a kind of fatal, a spirit of decline. Just now a great French philosopher published a book called La Decadence. It means decline. And so there is a spirit, an intellectual spirit, about who we are. I, I got one of those. And uh, usually I say, those who speak about decline, they say more about themselves than about the world or about you.
uh, I agree with uh, this presidency, but also that uh, politics uh, plays uh, the significant role, especially in trying to create peace within the uh, multicultural region, like European Union, uh, but also uh, like in Indonesia. Uh, but again, uh, I try to emphasize that not only political entities uh, may play a significant role, but also uh, the uh, educational institution has the same uh, uh, opportunity to create a peace. Uh, uh, embedding the uh, theme or topics of uh, integration, multiculturalism in every level of education are very, very important. Uh, like, uh, this is my personal experience when I was in Germany. Uh, how they try to uh, socialize the integration for the infant in kindergarten. They create a comics that's very interesting to understand for the children to get uh, what is the differences, what is the differences uh, in terms of race, in terms of nationality, in terms of uh, politics to a certain extent and everywhere in, in Germany I saw the sticker in this is different with with Brown and Auslander we need the foreigners meaning that uh, German cannot live cannot uh, build themselves without the foreigners because they live in Europe uh, this spirit was uh, introduced to the children at the very beginning. And it's very, very important if, uh, if we are uh, uh, talking in terms of education, how to uh, build this based on multicultural uh, society. That's my opinion. Differences, but they are the can become an opportunity that may also become the problems. But this man just address the tolerances. Tolerance can be used one of the tools or instruments to make a diversity as an opportunity. But there is also a, there is also a positive correlation and between degrees of wealth, tingkat kesejahteraan, with the readiness to learn to tolerate. On the Indonesian context, is on the complex experience that actually the triggers that really trigger ones is still according to the mass law law is there still some of them coming from the basic needs so we need to address that one issues also but there is also learning from those conflicts coming from there is an elite competition actually so in a competency in a competition era during the competition or in competence ones that cannot dialogue by logics they usually use the power so it is important that the government also take a key role and say big forms in addressing this kind of uh, unwanted action <coughs> Any other questions from the floor? Please, uh, please line up in the, uh, in the end. Uh, please state your name and your question. Short one. Thank you. Thank you, Supriyadi. Thank you, Supriyadi, a faculty member of University of Morality Schools. Um, it's excellent, Sibori. So thank you very much for sharing uh, the journey to the culturalism. And I believe that the increase of differences is a, a key to innovations. I mean, the, the cross-pollinations of the differences is really good. But
But I think we also have to think about the level of difference. So I believe people probably um, can work together in this we are different, but not to difference. So I believe in the uh, Europe countries, probably they see um, the other countries, it's different, but not to difference. But to compare with the refugees, it's probably the level of difference is so high, the, the gap of it. So I think um, the issue is how do you, or how do we um, you know, try to make sure that the differences, especially of the high differences, we also uh, fruitful and we will work together, especially in the increasing of the differences. How do you see that uh, in the you know, journey of the geopolitical differences? Thank you very much. Three questions, and then and I'll, and I'll answer those questions. Thank you very much. My name is Roger Darmo. I'm the member here at the Bank of Museum I think uh, pluralism, diversity, and multiculturalism is really a factor of life, as for us in Indonesia. Um, but considering from you coming from Europe, I think it's really uh, a really different context. I think, to my mind, uh, that Indonesia has a lot more complex, uh, we talk about multiculturalism, I think Europe. I mean, uh, Europe is really close to my heart, I lived there five years, so, but I'd like to know your opinion regarding uh, multiculturalism in Europe, could it be duplicated, or could it be replicated to, to our country in Indonesia? Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Chata, I'm an alumni of this campus. Uh, my questions will be, I would like to know your opinion uh, regarding Brexit. Uh, you said earlier that one of the triggers is uh, about the migrants, how the uh, British uh, help uh, threaten uh, about their opportunities from the migrants. So, uh, uh, from your point of view, uh, in the European, European Union, would you agree if I say that the risks are selfish regarding their action of leaving the European Union? And uh, that kind of action will actually be a threat to multiculturalism in the Brit the Britain itself. Uh, and if that is true, uh, I believe that British people are more have higher education level than Indonesia, but it still do happen, right? So. Do you think education alone is enough to prevent that kind of uh, questions? Which one? Sorry. Last question. Oh, uh, I believe that uh, the Britain has better education level overall uh, per person than Indonesia today. So, uh, but that kind of uh, rejection towards the migrants still do happen in the Britain. So, uh, the, do the, does the education alone by raising the education level alone is enough to prevent uh, rejection from the migrants in Indonesia. Thank you. So, first of all, the question of refugees, sometimes the difference is hard to be guessed to. And uh, that's what makes difficult so-called integration. Uh, at the end, I believe we are going to succeed. It's going to be a trial and error process, it will be muddling through. And you have said rightly that there are in great cases in terms of education starting when kids are very small, explaining to them that uh, it's important to see together that the other the foreigner is not an enemy. It's someone that brings also something to our societies. But it's challenging because there are, let's be frank among ourselves, there are prejudices, sometimes ethnic prejudices, sometimes also religious prejudices. And this is challenging. That requires a lot of effort from the authorities, from society, from the, not only from the governments, from the universities, from all of us. Um, but I believe we are going to succeed. And from my opinion, and that is something I have not yet said today, the most important thing is to think not in terms of minorities, not in terms of communities, but in terms of people. And when I say people, I, I mean a concrete person, a man, a woman, a child. By the way, the European institutions, 
institutions. In the treaty, we say the rights, we don't say rights of minorities, we say rights of people belonging to minorities. Because what is important at the end is one concrete person. It reminds me of what one of a British officer that said about his father. My father loved mankind in general, but he hated every individual in particular. I mean, that's not good. What for me is important is not a community, a group. For me, it's, this is a construct. Important is a person. So, if we have this, let's call it philosophy or doctrine, of putting above all the human dignity, then everybody has to have the same rights and there should be no discrimination. That's another point that's very important when dealing with this issue of integration. No discrimination, no discrimination in terms of gender and a woman, because unfortunately there are societies where there is idea that the woman is not so important as a man. No discrimination of gender, no discrimination in terms of religion, no discrimination in terms of ethnicity or race, no discrimination also in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, social, uh, uh, let's say, dignity or uh, social conditions. So to put the emphasis on the person, and uh, it's sometimes challenging, but that's very good. Second issue about Indonesia, I'm not going, of course, to to give advice to Indonesia because I recognize that you are a very complex society uh, with another kind of history. Uh, a country that I admire very much, by the way, I want to say I, to, to you. So I don't think we can translate the models immediately. And there is, one, of course, one very important difference. European Union is 27 or 28 countries. You are one country. And I think it makes um, but I think it's good to be one country. I will not advise fragmentation. In Europe, there is also countries that are now feeling pressure for a division. There was recently a referendum for Scotland to be independent. There are strong movements for independence in Catalonia and Spain. There are issues, for instance, in Belgium between Flanders and the other part. So there are also at smaller, uh, lower level, uh, pressures for um, disintegration. Why? It's a question of identity. That's why we have to promote, <clears throat> I think, the concept of open identity. Yes, I understand perfectly well that people want to feel that their identity is respected. Their traditions, their religion, their way of life, their language, why not? That's not in itself bad. The question is, to do it in a way that it's not exclusive. There is a French officer that said once a very beautiful sentence, I'm going to translate it in English. He said, patriotism is the love of what belongs to us. Nationalism is the hate, hate of what belongs to the others. And that's the difference. I can be patriotic, I can love my, my identity without despising the others. But when there is an idea that my identity is better than yours, when we come to this complex of superiority of some, as we had in Europe, there was at the same moment in Germany precisely, Nazi Germany, Deutschland über alles, the German above everybody, the idea of racial superiority that happened with Hitler, this is not acceptable. And then we have to be extremely strong defending the principle of human dignity, that every person, not minority, every man or woman and child has exactly the same dignity as the other. And that is the key point from a philosophical point of view. But afterwards, political situations, they have to be there. And I'm sure that in Indonesia, that by the way, Indonesia is seen outside Indonesia as one of the biggest countries in the world, the biggest Muslim country in the world, and the case of tolerance. We know there are challenges here, but basically, in Europe, there is admiration by the situation in Indonesia. We consider it, compared with many of the situations we are seeing outside, a good positive example. And I hope that Indonesia leaders and Indonesia people will, keep, will demonstrate that is the case. Final question on Brexit. Uh, 
It's confirmed by the empirical studies that the main cause for total complexity was control of migration. And, uh, but it's quite interesting because there was a level of, of many differences. For instance, the people of the regions where there are more foreigners, they did not vote for Brexit, they voted to remain. London, for instance, London voted massively to remain, not for Brexit, and it's London, is the area in Britain where there are more foreigners. <laughs> so, to some extent, the, the, those who were campaigning for Brexit were manipulating fear, fear of the unknown. There was campaign, British jobs for British workers. But the reality is that Britain will continue to re require foreigners because a lot, because some jobs the British don't want to do. Because the, their level of education is already very high, and there are some, uh, uh, let's say, not sophisticated jobs that they simply don't want to do. At the same time, for very, very qualified jobs, they require people from the outside. Now, of course, I am resident in the UK, and I'm living in the United Kingdom. And I'm not British. But they've invited me to go there, but not the opposite. You see, so I really believe that uh, that demagogy is going to show that it was not credible. Because Britain is a very open society to the rest of the world, also because of its past. And it will remain so. But there was such a pressure now, coming because of the enlargement of the opinion, when many people from Central and Central European come, that that created a negative reaction in parts of the, in parts of the British public. But I think Britain, for instance, London, will remain a very, a very open uh, society and a very open city. By the way, it's probably one of the two most important financial centers in the world. And they have been in keeping it like that. So the education also is interesting to see, on average, in Britain, if you look at the results of the Brexit, the more educated people voted to remain in the European Union, the less uh, educated voted to leave. So there were some differences, but of course the majority voted against staying in Ukraine, as we know, but I think that we can't deal with that. We can't deal with that, and Europe uh, will always remain very close to Britain, and Britain to the European Union. But now we have to see, and there will be negotiations, to try to see what is going to be the new type of relation. Any other questions? I just would like to share the similar case and differences in between migrants in the UK and the parts of migrations in Indonesia. The, sim the similar case that the resentments of the local indigenous populations, that's the similarities. But the difference is that in the UK, because they have a high tolerance behaviors, then the difference it is in Indonesian's context, and they are not able to compete with their competitors. They are trying to host another groups of identity, for example, either it is ethnic or religious, and mostly in Indonesia is to see the religious groups to present another competitors. So uh, I actually would like to have another round of questions, but if you don't mind cutting up a little bit of your lunch time, is it okay? Because I see, you know, hands going up there, back there, so, um, so I would like to have one more round. Yeah, I have to ask the other host. Okay, one more round, three questions, quick questions, five minutes for the questions, and then we will have about 10 to 15 minutes for the answers. Please, uh, just line up on the, uh, uh, by the mic, please. Thank you. Good, quick question. Thank you. A quick question. My name is Sukasa. I'm a faculty member here. And uh, I do agree with what this man when he says that uh, the sources of, 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 uh, of the stability of Europe, and I do also agree with His Excellency that Europe has been the laboratory of tolerance. And uh, my question is that this Europeanism, the ECS, has been a product of the 20th century tinkering of ideas. And do you think that Europe's journey to multiculturalism is actually a journey to multiculturalism or a drift from multiculturalism? Aren't 
European countries moving towards a uniculturalism. That's my question. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for your opportunity. My name is Michael uh, from Prasnia Mulia. Uh, I'm a business student. Uh, just a quick question that I see there is uh, some kind of uh, the root cause of multiculturalism problem is I think the manipulation of politi for political purposes. So uh, as I see there is a symptom that our world is getting more in difficult state and the issue of multiculturalism is uh, caused by use of political uh, things. Uh, so my question is, uh, what can we do to, to, to overcome the, the manipulation of the political issue? And the second one is, is there any single measurement of how can we measure the uh, multiculturalism or a level of accept acceptance as a, as a world in the multiculturalism? Thank you. Because uh, it's excellent we have the young interview, so we would like to have um, one more question. I'm so sorry for the, uh, the rest of the uh, uh, participant wants to ask questions. So just one more, and then just a quick answer, sir, so that they can actually uh, do the next interview. So five minutes will be OK? Right, yeah. OK, five minutes. Uh, one more question. Thank you for the opportunity to sit. I would like to ask a very quick question on the upcoming election of the four major countries in Europe, France, Germany, Italy, and Netherlands. Uh, do you see any uh, follow-up movement uh, like Brexit? And if I may, just uh, one, uh, one last question. I see that the rise of populism recently is driven by labor market, economic reasons, very rational, you lose your job. Uh, how do you see Things that can be improved in how European manage the supranational immunity, especially in the euro currency, for example. Maybe it is too strong for the European countries as weak, like Greece, or maybe it is just too weak for a very export-based <laughs> countries like Germany, who already raised the surplus to 8.7 dollar since 2009. Thank you. Good morning, telling the answers. But now, the issue of multiculturalism, let me just say the following. First question Are we going for multiculturalism or are we going for unilateralism? Uh, unicultural. My opinion is that in Europe we are going to remain multicultural, uh, not uh, unified. Uh, the European Union is very. I want to reach everyone. Um, the European is a very original construct. When you think about European Union, we have to avoid two mistakes. One is think about European Union as just an international organization, like uh, NATO, like uh, UN, like uh, OECD, uh, like ASEAN. No, the European Union is more integrated. Many of the powers are no longer the states, they are at European level. The law of the European Union. It's implemented directly in our country. So it has a primacy over national law. It is a supranational country. But, and that but is important, the European Union is not a state. We are not the United States of Europe. And I don't think we are going to be in the foreseeable future. So it's something, uh, in Latin we say, a, a tertium genus. So it's something in the middle, very original, that has some elements of a state. For instance, the European Central Bank has, in some cases, more powers than the Federal Reserve of the United States. But at the same time, we are not fully integrated. So this is why I think multiculturalism is going to continue. But I've told you very sincerely that there are today threats, there are politicians in Europe that want to Put an end to that. And then I'm now already answering the last question about the next elections. We are going to have elections in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, probably also in Italy. My assessment is the following. In the Netherlands, it is possible that the far-right candidate, who is, in fact, a xenophobic leader, 
will win, but it will not have a majority. So it will come first, but there will be a coalition of the others. So I think Holland and Netherlands will remain on the right direction. France, of course, we will really have a real problem in Europe if Madame Le Pen, as a far-right xenophobic leader, will win. I think she may win the first round, but I'm almost sure she will lose the second round.